part. Uh, that extra gear, that first three steps. Huge strides in the performance. That I might not be the player I am today. All right, welcome to another episode of Behind the Gear. And uh, today we have a local artist. And um, Dan Pittens has been uh, obviously kind of popping off the last little bit, Dan. And I just want to see, well, number one thing, how are you doing, Dan? And I know you we're going to get into your background and stuff like that, but I'm really excited to have you on today because I love kind of uh, showing other areas of hockey and how, how players that maybe are playing now or people that love the game can get into it and maybe maybe turn their passion into a bit of a, a full-time gig. So number one thing, how are you doing? How's everything going through this whole uh, crazy times that we're living right now? Oh, it's, it changes all the time, but I mean, I'm doing great, you know, making the most of it. I've been looking forward to this podcast and this chat for a couple of weeks now. So I'm super, super happy to be here. Awesome, man. Well, no, I appreciate you coming on. And um, so I guess for people that don't know, Dan, you put together a kind of a, an unreal portfolio so far, and I'm sure you're still building it, but, uh, and I'm going to be selfish here talking more about, uh, the hockey side of it and kind of the, the hockey yeah. player side of it, but you've been doing drawings of, of NHL players and, uh, from goalies to players to, to basically kind of covering the, the whole gamut, but, um, and they're all pencil drawings. I was, I was just, I, you know, and anyone who's not familiar, you can look it up and you've done a lot over kind of time lapse, uh, just to kind of. I, I don't want to say prove, but yeah, I'm actually really doing this. It doesn't because if you look at them, some, if you look at the picture, you're like, that's just a black and white picture that someone's taken and maybe done some Photoshop to, you know. But uh, watching the time lapse is really, really cool to watch you, you know, kind of go start to finish from a white canvas to the end product. It's it's unreal to watch. So if anyone hasn't seen it, you got to check them out. Um, but the time lapse thing and, and doing all that, I was joking with my wife the other night when we were watching, I'm like, this can't be that hard, man. He did it in like a minute, <laughs> right? Look how fast yeah. his hands are moving. This is so easy. Uh, yeah. But how long does it take you start to finish to do an actual, uh, an actual portrait? So my answer to that question actually changes all the time <laughs> simply because every drawing that I do, I get a little bit more ambitious with it. So it, each drawing is taking more and more time, but I would say that the average time that it would take is probably around 20 to 25 hours, somewhere around there. I mean, the Cujo that I just did, um, that's been my biggest piece so far, most detailed piece. And that took about 40 hours. And is that, <laughs> that has basically two pictures in one though, right? If I'm, is that the one, is it, is it the one where he's one, I know, I can't remember the goaltender, but there's one goalie that you have kind of facing and then a side shot of them as well in the same. Oh, point. right. Uh, that one is my Tampa Bay drawing. Okay. That one I did last year with uh, Vasilevsky and Javi Bulin. Okay. Um, so the latest one that I did, Cujo is just a single portrait of his, you know, sort of his iconic Toronto Maple Leafs mask. Yeah. Yeah. And then when you're doing goalies and I mean, the mask alone is crazy, right? Because oh, yeah. the detail in the mask is like, oh, yeah. it's insane. Oh it, yeah, absolutely. I, I can, I don't, you'll see, if you look through my portfolio, I would say that there's definitely a lot more skaters and there are goalies and there's reasons for that. <laughs> yeah, the, the masks are so fun to draw, but they take forever to do, sure. right? Like you think about, I'm drawing, I'm sort of doing a piece of art of somebody else's art really right. when it comes down to it, you know? Yeah. And so I want to do a good job and I want to try to render that as close as I can to what the artist did originally. I'm not using airbrushes. Like you said, I'm using a pencil and maybe things take a little bit longer, but yeah, I, I definitely work hard on getting that original detail in there. Oh, it's unbelievable, man. Even uh, there, there was one shot. It might've been Marner's picture. Uh, where you have like, you know, on his visor, there's a reflection, I think, on the boards, right? And <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah. you look at it and like, and that would happen if you looked at, you know, if you actually looked at him in a game or you guys were talking, you could see the reflection of something if you really, for, if you really looked into it. So looking at those little details, I mean, it's, it's insane. I, yeah, it's, it's crazy to me, man. And I'm not an artist at all. So I was that kid in school that if you gave me pens and pencils or markers and a, and a piece of paper, I mean if I was copying something off of anything, it'd be, it would look terrible. So <laughs> going back to kind of the beginning when you were yeah. in school, do you already cut, do you kind of have a knock? You know, if anybody right now is listening and you're thinking back to school, maybe you were a good artist or not a good artist at that level. But remember when you had an art class and you had something that you had to draw and you had 15 kids draw it. And there was like, you know, I was the bottom two kids, three kids of my drawing, but then there's always a couple of kids in class that just were naturally like gifted at, you know, and not, not saying they're going to become artists, but they were just naturally good at art. Maybe they practiced a lot, whatever, it, whatever it is. But were you that kind of, were you that kind of student that was had kind of had a knack for art? 
Uh, yeah, I would, I would say so. I mean, I've, I've drawn all my life. People always ask me, how long have you drawn for? I've only drawn seriously for just over a year now, but I would, from those young ages, uh, you know, grade three, grade four, I was one of those kids in class where if everybody had to draw something, I would be one of the ones where people would say, oh, wait a minute. Like there's something there, you, you know, there's, yeah. there's definitely a talent in there. So yeah, I would say I was one of those kids. Yeah. Now was sure. that, was that something like were your parents big on like doing arts and crafts at home and doing like, you know what I mean? Cause or is it something that was just naturally like you were pretty good at, at you know, with your dexterity and being able to kind of draw things like, you, you know what I mean? I'm taking yeah. it back to the kind of simple things, but was it something that was kind of just, you had it, it was kind of a natural talent? Yeah, I would say that my parents, and they'll attest to this, certainly, they, they're not artists themselves. They, <laughs> okay. So they, they don't know where this really came from. Um, but like I said, like there was always something there. There was always something that drew me um, to the pencil and paper. I, I loved going outside, you know, shooting the tennis ball around against the hockey night and, and whatever, but, uh, and I love my video games and, and whatnot, but definitely for some reason, I was always really drawn to art. So I don't, I, nobody has the explanation for it. I don't really have the explanation for it. It's just something I've always loved to do. So you were that kid in our class that like pissed all the other kids off. <laughs> You never practice. We just like you get, a, you get an A, and we're sitting there with our D's, being like, "Man, this this guy doesn't even practice, and he's really good." Yeah, yeah. Kids are walking by trying to sabotage, smudge the. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah, 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 that's right. Oh, uh, that's great, man. And so, I mean, growing up, like, did you ever, did you ever kind of migrate to thinking, man? I think maybe, I, maybe I'll get into comic books. Maybe I'll get into drawing. Maybe I'll get in. Like, was that ever a thought as you were going through kind of high school and things like that, or was it just kind of something you did on the side for fun? Never. I, never. I never thought about it. Um, from a young age, you know, people were very quick to say, yeah, there's a talent there. You're great at drawing, but don't do it. <laughs> don't, don't pursue it. You want to do it for fun. Yeah. That's great. But if you want to be successful, don't do art. And I guess I believed that. Uh, I believe what people were telling me from the beginning and even in high school, you know, you do those aptitude tests, like in careers class, whatever, you try to figure out what you should do with your life. And yeah. two things yeah. came out of that. It was physiotherapist and graphic designer. Really? And yeah. And I just immediately, I dismissed the graphic designer part. And I was like, I'm, I'm not going to make money on this. There's no point. The money's going to be in the medical field. And I've always just really pursued that. And art was never on my radar at all. Well, that's crazy, man. <laughs> Now going through kind of high school and, and, and finishing all that up, um, you know, you end up going to obviously going to university and, and coming out and you've had a couple of different professions and, you know, and I know, and anyone who's kind of read up on you and stuff knows that, you know, you, you got in teaching a little bit, you got into physiotherapy a little bit, you got into web developing. Um, so you've had basically three solid careers that most people would love to have one of them and just ride it over 20 years, 25 years. Yeah. Um, so what, what was it like kind of switching or why did you switch different careers? Were you just kind of getting bored of it or not really enjoying it as much as you thought and then kind of switch to the next thing? So I always wanted, well, I always thought I wanted to be a, uh, be a physiotherapist from the beginning. And that's what my focus was ever since grade seven, that, that was it. It was that or nothing. And I never really stopped to think, is it right for me? What is this profession truly? It's just, I fell in love with the idea from a young age, but I think I needed to make the switch because it came down to my mental health. Uh, yeah. It was really affecting me going into work every day, trying to get through the days. Like a lot of people, you know, they don't like their jobs or they struggle with their jobs for whatever reason. For myself, it, it really hit me hard on a day-to-day -day basis. And it was really impacting me in my personal life and my marriage. And finally, you know, we made the decision as a family, my wife and I, and said, you got to do something else. So making the switch, it, it, it was difficult and it was a change, but I don't think it was as tough as a lot of people believe it would be for somebody just because I was just so ready to do it. And it was such a relief to, to make the change to something else in each time that it happened. Right. So it was scary, but always a relief for me. What was the path and like, what, what, what was your first kind of profession? And then, and then, uh, then, then what was that kind of first switch or second switch? So the first career was physiotherapy, mm -hmm. right? And that was my goal from grade seven. And then um, from there, when I got out of that, I went into web development. Yeah. And then when web develop, when I found that web development wasn't really working, or it was more of like a um, a simultaneous thing, sort of the opportunity came up from Fanshawe College for me to be a professor as well. So I was sort of doing both of those at one time. And yeah. then eventually, I started getting into art. You know, when COVID happened, and the art just kind of took off. And I just said, you know, I love this so much. I've been pursuing money all my life. And I think it's time to try to follow something that I love. I love that, man. Yeah. One thing too, that, that I think is, is really impactful here is, 
I think a lot of us, I, and to be honest with you, when I was going through school, I took, you know, exercise physiology and I have a, a you know, kin degree from, from school, from university. And I was going to either get into physiotherapy or become like an athletic kind of nice. a trainer. And that was kind of always my goal and always something that I wanted to do. I didn't, I kind of got into that a little bit, obviously. And then now I'm more on ice and doing, you know, obviously more skill development, stuff like that. But it must've been hard though, when, when you go from like, let's say grade seven, grade eight, all the way to university and then getting that kind of, let's call it a dream job that you kind of always wanted. And I think a lot of times, you know, young, young, young people go through that process, get to that dream job, whether it's a physio, a lawyer, a doctor, uh, whatever that is, doesn't matter what developer, you know, and then realize, man, this isn't exactly kind of what I thought it might be, or, you know, what, what that kind of image I had in my head, you know, so how hard was it to kind of give up on that or not give up, but kind of change gears when you were, where do you kind of want it to be? Like, how tough was that to say, you know what, no, I'm not going to do this anymore. I, I was in denial for a really long time. You know, yeah. you spend a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of resources. You have a lot of other people supporting you, right? Sure. Uh, I identified myself as somebody who was going to be a physiotherapist for so long. And finally, you are a physiotherapist and that's how you identify, you know, so you really have to take a hard look in the mirror and say, is this who I am? And is this who I want to be? And not everybody, you know, directly associates themselves or identifies themselves as, you know, so tightly with what they do on a day-to-day basis. But my career and what I do, you know, eight hours a day has always been uh, very important to me. So um, yes, it, it is very, very difficult to look in the mirror and, and acknowledge those things and say, yes, I was wrong. Sure. <laughs> and this is, a, you know, tens of thousands of dollars of mistakes that you've made, but do you really want to, <clears throat> you know, continue the rest of your life with that lie, you know, and, and kind of go further down that hole? Or do you want to say, I'm going to cut my losses, I'm going to admit to myself, and I'm going to start doing something that I really love. So no, it was very difficult. Yeah, I know. I love it. You know, there's one thing this happened to me in, in a couple different instances in my life where I, I kind of looked at myself and I said, you know what, do, I don't want to wake up at 35 or 40 and be miserable because I, yeah. I chose this, right? Yeah. Whether that's a relationship or whether that's a, a job or whatever it is. And one other thing you said that I love is, you know, I stopped kind of chasing the dollar. I stopped worrying about making that, going into a profession that's going to make me a lot of money or going into, you know, get a project that's going to hopefully get me a big bonus. And I think that is so important, man. I think it's, you know, not that money's important, obviously, because, you know, you got to pay rent or or your mortgages and things like that. But at the end of the day, I think, man, what's the value of being happy, right? What's the value of like coming home and and not, you know, bitching to your wife for hours about how crappy work was, right? Like, I think there's some, some value there and it's not monetary, but at the same time, man, there's such a big, uh, such a big piece of just being happy in life that goes way further than any kind of money that anybody can make, you know? hundred percent. And I think about this a lot. I think there's a change that's happened in society, you know, generation before myself, my parents and many others that I've talked to, they say it's, you know, we worked hard so that you could have a better life, <clears throat> you know? And, and so they, they were able to grind it out, go to their jobs and, and really separate their careers from their personal lives and really get the most out of their life. And I have so much respect for people who are able to do that, you know, separate those two. And then, our generation, it's, it is about, you know, living the better life and we're trying to figure out what that is and and how do we do that? And so it's the idea of, of having a better job and having a job that pays better so you can have the better life. Right. But we don't really stop to think, is it, money that's going to make us happy or is it, you know, what we're doing on the day to day that's, that's going to make us happy. And it took me a while to figure it out. No, totally. I think a lot of times too, we're, we're always going to be obviously impressioned or we're always going to have like, our path is going to be a little bit not dictated, but we're, we're going to have influences right with our parents. And I think the generation I'm from, and I'm, I'm sure you're very similar is, you know, my, a lot of, a lot of parents, especially my buddy's parents and stuff were get a job that has a good pension that you can get good retirement out of that has good benefits ride it all for 20, 30 years, pay off your mortgage. You know what I mean? And that's kind of old school thinking. I was from two parents that were self-employed and, you know, went through the ups and downs of self-employment. So for me, I think I always kind of gravitated towards being my own boss potentially, or, or trying to start something on my own, which, you know, didn't realize how much of a grind that was till I actually tried to do it. (laughs) Uh, But, um, but yeah, to your point, I think it's, I think it's awesome. And I think it takes a lot of balls to be able to say, you know what, I'm going to change pace here. I'm going to, I'm going to switch out of what I, you know, even something like, you know, you've got a good paycheck, you've got a good job, you're working and to say, you know what, no, I, I don't want to do that, man. I'm going to try this. I think is, is, is great. And then going from, you know, two or three really, I don't want to say secure, but really good professions to now saying, you know what, I'm going to be an artist <laughs> yeah. with, with zero pension, and zero paycheck, <laughs> zero, zero anything. Right. Yeah. Uh, 
is is huge. And I mean, obviously that comes or that only happens with a good support group, right? Like you talked about your wife, yeah. but you got to have people around you that are like, no man, go ahead, do it. You know, you'll, we'll, we'll make it work. If we have to take out a line of credit or we have to go, whatever, we'll, we'll dip into savings, but let's, you know, if this is what you want to do. And obviously they believed in you and, uh, and, and are open kind of the, I, I guess the path to where, where you are now. Yeah, I owe so much to my wife, my mother, um, and a couple other very key people that, you know, at a time where, you know, here I am, I'm working as a professor for Fanshawe College, and yes, it pays good, and yes, there is that stability there, um, but, you know, I'll, I'll, they all sat down and said, like, you have such a talent here, like, you've been through a few careers already, are you sure this is what you want to do, are you sure this is what's right for you, um, and so I, I think I, and I do have a lot of people ask me, you know, how do I become a successful artist? How do I make it? And I can talk about, oh, yeah, the little techniques, you know, make sure you draw this way, make sure you draw that way. But really, like you said, at the end of the day, having that support group is so key. It's so key. So I owe so much to them. Yeah, no, that's yeah, that that's awesome. And I'm sure probably like, you know, behind the scenes, your wife's like, honestly, man, I can't listen to you, bitch, but your jobs anymore. So if you like art, oh, yeah. just draw all day. I don't yeah, yeah. It's just draw. Yeah, I remember one conversation. She's like, I don't know what you have to do, but you have to stop doing physio. <laughs> She's like, we're going to continue to be husband and wife. You have to yeah, stop doing physio. Totally. And I was like, yeah. okay, all right, let's, let's, let's figure something else out. Right. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> Love it. Um, so now, yeah, like, so I guess your first piece, so you end up saying, you know what, I'm going to, I'm done. I'm, I'm, I'm going to jump into art. And obviously the pandemic probably had something to do with that a little bit, just as far sure. as everyone's working from home. It's a very different atmosphere. People are getting laid off, things like that. Um, how did you, you know, when, when you actually sat down or when you had the idea of getting the paper out and the pencils out again, what kind of, what went through your head or what was your first piece or what were you kind of thinking of? Like, I think I'm going to go in this area. Yeah. Well, from, so the first time I really got back into drawing, when I say back into it's because I put the pencils down for a long time, you know, especially when I got into university, but yeah. here I am, I'm in physiotherapy and I'm really struggling. I'm having a hard time mentally. I don't know what I'm going to do with my life. I don't know where I'm going. And for some reason, I picked up the pencil again. I don't know why. Uh, I just, you know, one day I had the urge to do it. And I'm a huge fan of the show, The Office. That's my right. favorite show of all time. Yeah. And for some reason, I wanted to draw Prison Mike, Michael Scott. Right. Okay. And, and yeah. so I started drawing and I sat down and I drew for like eight hours straight. I had never sat for that long drawing anything. Any drawing I've ever done was about a couple hours at the most. And the eight hours just flew by and I felt so good afterwards. And I shared it with a few people and they loved it too. And they smiled and they got joy from it. So I posted online and more people loved it and more people got joy. Not everybody loved it. There's always criticisms sure. and whatnot, yeah. but just that ongoing positivity that I got from it and how good I felt while I was doing it. It was, it was such like a, a form of meditation for me. So I went on this string of just drawing things that I loved. Uh, you know, other office characters, celebrities, no hockey players yet for about a six month period. And eventually people started saying, can you draw my dog? Can you draw my loved one? And seeing the look on people's faces when they got the piece of paper in their hand and they're looking at, you know, their dog that passed away six months ago or whatever it was, it just, it felt so good to me. And then eventually when I got very, very comfortable with my skills, I finally had the courage to draw my favorite player of all time, favorite skater of all time, Peter Forsberg. So I, I started getting into that. Didn't know where it was going to go. Again, it's just something else that I loved. Um, and then partway through drawing him, this is actually the finished drawing. Okay. Um, awesome. By the way, it's one, yeah, it's one of the few originals that I have left. I won't give it up. Um, <laughs> uh, and partway through drawing him, I went over to a, a former teacher's place um grade eight teachers name is jeremy roselle and i sat down and he he just asked me a lot of questions all related to art he was so intrigued by how i did certain things and he wanted to see my portfolio and he said dan i, I don't know what your plan is you know you've got this thing with fanshawe you, you coming up you, you're doing this physiotherapy stuff like i don't know where you're going with it but i promise you if, if you pursue this this art that you're doing right now good things are going to happen and even when he said that, honestly, I dismissed it. I, I really did in my head. I said, no, people have all, you know, always told me all my life, this isn't going anywhere. But the more I thought about it, the more I said, why not try? Why not give it a shot? You know, you've gambled so many times before this. Um, why not try one more time? And I came home, talked to my mom, talked to my wife. And they said, you know what, do what you want to do. And then that was the turning point. And then like a week later, I finished Peter Forsberg, put it online and the NHL gets wind of it. They love it. They contact me and ask me if they can share it. 
And that's when the whole hockey thing kind of took off. Boy, that's so cool, man. Yeah. So cool. And it, it goes back again to like the kind of the era we're in right now, but how social media can, and I, I it just kind of organically happened, obviously, but man, social media is so, it's so important and so impactful. And the outreach is unreal as far as, you know, you can, you know, reach out to somebody in Ireland, you know, someone in, yeah. in wherever loves your, your, your painting and, uh, or sorry, your, your, your drawing, which is, yeah, it's so, so cool. What was it like when you got the call from the NHL or the email from the NHL? Was it kind of like, was it like <laughs> obviously not expected, but were you like, okay, this is bullshit. Or were you like, I, yeah. I didn't think it was real. Yeah. I, I didn't think it was real. Right. It, it, so it's a message that just comes through on, on social media. Um, and they're like, Hey, I'm a representative from the NHL social media. We'd love to sh- share your drawing with permission. Obviously let us know if this is okay. And I called my wife over right away and I was like, is this real? Like, she's like, that's real. I'm like, this is a big deal, right? She said, it's a big deal. (laughs) So so even that I said, yeah, absolutely. Go for it. Um, Tag me permissions and and whatnot. Please go for it. But even then I was still skeptical. I was like, is this really going to happen? You know, maybe it is them and they decide against it. I don't know what's going to happen. But then on a Friday afternoon, I'm working out and then 2 PM, I see a pop up on my feed. I was like, Oh, I, I lost it. I honestly cried. <laughs> yeah, no, no, man. That's so cool. It, yeah, it was that real first affirmation that this something is possible, you yeah. know, to me to see it on that kind of a scale. Not even not not even that, man. You you just made the NHL, dude. Like you made the NHL. That's sick. Uh, Right? Oh yeah, not as like a player, I, but you made the uh, NHL. Really cool. <laughs> yeah, that's right. When I was on uh, with the uh, with the NHL interview, they're like, how, "How did you know when you were gonna make it into the bigs?" You know, we asked the yeah. we asked the players, "How did they know they were gonna make it in the bigs?" And, and the, yeah, that was definitely a key moment for me. That's awesome, man. That's so yeah. cool. Now, when you look back at that, like when you got, kind of got back into art and and we're and we're drawing the pictures of the office and, and prison Mike and stuff like that. When you go back and look at those painting or those I call them paintings, sorry, those, those that's okay. Those, no, it's fine. Drawings, like that let's say office mike compared to what you're doing now how much better have you gotten over the last you know this time period like when you go back and look is it like man that's really not as good as this or let's be honest that's yeah shitty compared to this like how much better <laughs> have you gotten just by practicing and doing it and continuing to work on your craft oh so much better i, I look back at that prison mic and i am almost embarrassed that i did it right so, but yeah. everybody's got a starting point you know everybody's yeah. got somewhere where they're going to start and and sort of where they're at now and i if you look at my, so let's say a drawing that I did three weeks ago compared to one that I just did, Cujo, you, you know, you might not see too much difference in talent there or um, or outcome. But what I try to do with each drawing is pick something that I'm not confident in doing. It could be a little part, it can be a part of a mask, it can be a background or something like that, something that's outside of my wheelhouse, so that when I do it, I learn from it. So each drawing, I am trying to get better and better and picking specific things and specific, uh, specific ways of how I can actually get there. So when you add them up over the course of a year or so, yeah, there's a difference for sure. Yeah. And the reason I bring that up, because it's like anything, man, we talked, I talk, I have two young kids. I talk to them about this all the time. Like, how do you get better at stuff? Like, how do you get better at math? How do you get better at hockey? How do you get better at shooting soccer balls? Like at a practice, right? And you think yeah. of an artist and I, I would look at your art from, probably, you know, honestly, probably your first one, let's say prison Mike to now. And I'd be like, they, they both look awesome. And, but you know, yeah. I'm more of a naked eye or yeah, I'm, I'm not a trained eye at all where you are. That is terrible. This is so much better. And then even six months from now, I'd be, that is not as good as this, you know? And yeah, which is awesome. It's so cool to, you know, see someone kind of top of their game or getting to the top of their game and they're continuing, you know, continuing to improve. And we see the same thing with players and their skill sets, right? We see players continuing to evolve and getting better and always improving their game and adapting. Yeah. It's the same thing with kind of any profession. So it's, yeah, it's cool to hear you say that. Yeah. And I've always been drawn to like the mastery of professions, <clears throat> right? And with physiotherapy, I, I quickly realized that it's not the type of profession that you master. <laughs> it's, you sure. know, you can go to courses and courses and courses and you might never see improvement and outcomes. It's, it's very subjective. And I think the more I realized that, the more uncomfortable I got with it. So, you know, I've been searching professions and trying to find something that has a certain level of mastery to it. And with drawing, I I can see objectively, or maybe subjectively, depending on how you look at it, but I I can see as I go that I am getting better. And, you know, there's there's never going to be a way to 100% master it. Some other people might disagree and be like, oh my goodness, you're a master with the pencil right now. But, you know, I don't see it that way. I just always see an opportunity to get better. And I think that's another reason why I'm really drawn to it. Yeah, I know. Yeah, it's cool. And I think, yeah, to your point, like you're probably, let's be honest, like, you know, 
one of the best, right. As, as far as in, in your craft, but you're constantly Thank trying you. to get better. Right. And, and you're going to continue Always. to like push that, we'll call it push that pencil, but push the needle a little bit, push that bar <laughs> a bit and keep, you know, keep trying to get, which is, yeah, I love it, man. I think it's, I think it's, it's awesome. Now, with the attention with the NHL and kind of, you know, getting your stuff out there, obviously, and I'm sure a lot of people saw your videos and, and, uh, and, and your prints and stuff. Now, was it, did it kind of catch a little bit of fire after that, as far as just getting more requests for doing more pictures? Or did you just say, you know what, I gotta, I gotta build my portfolio here just in case there are people that want some of these pictures. Um, I would say that it was a steady build probably up until Christmas time. Okay. Um, and then uh, because each drawing that I came out with, I, I would say most of the time the NHL would share it. And I guess each time the NHL would share one of my drawings, there would be an increase in followers, an increase of people, you know, coming to see what I'm doing next and more message requests and more people wanting to see this and, and see that. So it's always been a steady incline. But then once I appeared on the NHL.com's interview, like that's when, you know, I sort of went on the national level and then started to get the attention of many others. Uh, and so now we're at the point, you know, where NHLers are reaching out and they're saying, you know, can I get this drawn or can I get that drawn? And so that's been super cool as well. That is really cool. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. I'm always floored. Like I'm always starstruck like, yeah. each and every time. Like I get oh, so excited. Like, like even this interview, honestly, yeah, I was, I was just so excited because I've seen some of the podcasts you've done and whatnot. I'm just like, Oh my God, this is so awesome. I can't believe I have this opportunity. <laughs> well, the, the thing I love about it is like, let's say somebody didn't know you and they saw you on, you know, the NHL network and they saw your stuff getting re, you know, kind of reposted by the NHL. And, and then, you know, what I love about what I, what I'm able to do or, or the conversation that we will have is like, you're, you're like, obviously you're unbelievable what you do. And and it, like you said, you're on a national level, but you're a dude, man, you're, you're a great guy. You're just, you know, you're a guy like all of us who like, <laughs> Thanks, struggle, no, but you know, you struggled with, man, I had a, I had a great profession. I didn't like it. I want to switch. You know what I mean? And that's what I yeah. love about it is like bringing things back down to like, you know, whether I have a, an NHL player on, that's like, yeah, I was, I was 10 years old at one point. I cried because my parents left me, you know what I mean? Whatever yeah. that is. Right. So yeah. I think it is cool to kind of bring it back down that like, this is possible for anybody, man. You know, Absolutely. and I'm not saying anyone's going to be as, you know, as good at, at, at drawing as you are good as a, a, a hockey player as an NHL player, but man, if you want it bad enough and you're willing to put the work in and, 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 and make some sacrifices. And I mean, obviously you've made some tough decisions because I'm sure leaving a good job, your wife wasn't super pumped about going from a good salary to zero, you know? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, th those are all hard decisions to make. And and I think, you know, it's, it's really important to share that stuff because uh, a lot of people are going through that stuff right now, especially with COVID. Like, man, what am I going to do after? Like, should I just sell everything and move to wherever some somewhere cheaper like there's a lot of stuff going on in people's heads right now and i think it's i think it's cool to hear stories like this you know and just it's it's for me anyway it's it's inspirational you know what i mean so i think it's uh yeah, yeah it's, it's really cool yeah I, I agree absolutely um now so moving forward i guess for you is it so now this is kind of obviously become like now this is your full-time gig this is what you're doing this is kind of your your kind of next level now right it is. Yeah. I'm all in. <laughs> I'm all in at okay, this point. Good. Absolutely. Yeah. Good. And so how does it work for you now? Or is it like, do you kind of look at it now? And this is where, this is where, this is where this might start to suck for you because now is it like, okay, I got to try to put in eight to 10 hours a day. Like, is it something where you have a bit of a schedule or are you able to kind of, you know, come and go a little bit and kind of work on your own kind of schedule? Or are you trying to put in like a good kind of work day every day to try to get pictures done? Yeah, I don't force it. And that's, yeah. that's the nice thing, you know, in terms of how I schedule my drawings, I try to get one drawing done a week, you know, mm -hmm. and like I said, the drawings, you know, originally were around like 16, 17 hours. Now they're upwards of 40 hours. Right. right? So the more ambition, I, I don't know how much more I want or how many more hours I want to put into individual drawings. Mm -hmm. You know, I do like to be able to have that frequency in terms of how often I am sharing my art. <clears throat> um, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I wouldn't say that. Um, it, I wouldn't say that, you know, there's, there's an increased pressure there to get that done, but I do like the frequency in getting them done on the week to week basis. But at the same time, I try to structure myself in a way that I'm not forced to be at the table. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I, I'm sometimes I sit down and draw for 15 minutes, get up, walk away, you know, grab a snack, come back. And now I'm able to sit for three or four. Uh, I really see in my art, um, the instances where I do feel like I'm forced to be at the table, you know, sure. I find that my quality does suffer. At least I interpret it that way. So I never, ever force my drawings. And if I have to push something out a week, then I push something out a week. I just never want to sacrifice the quality. So really I would say 95 plus percent of the time that my pencil's on the paper, I'm absolutely loving every second of it. And I think that's one of the keys, right? Is to uh, make sure that 
that you keep it fun and that and that you keep it passion driven right because yeah so many times man a lot a lot of people like you know whether it's printing t-shirts and you made these wicked t-shirts and you love them and then all of a sudden you got a ton of orders now you're just sitting at a machine printing t-shirts like yeah sucks, right so you want to make yeah you know, like 100 so i think i think that is such a big uh a big thing to make sure that whatever no matter what you do is kind of keep that passion there and obviously like make it fun and don't make it uh, a nine to five job which you know sometimes those kind of suck oh yeah <laughs> i've had a few of those <laughs> yeah. uh but i i always say now I, the success that i've had up until this point is I attribute it all to not chasing money, right? Not chasing the dollar, just yeah. chasing the passion. So all the big decisions that that we make when it comes to my art always stem from that central premise is, is this where the passion is? Is this where things lie? You know, honestly, I've had a lot of offers for very big projects with very big dollar values attached to them. And I just said, this is not something that I'm passionate about. This, this isn't something that I think I'm going to love to work on. You know what I mean? So, and, we, and we've turned those down and I don't see myself ever wavering from that. I love it. No, oh, I think that's great, man. I think, I think making decisions not based on money is huge. You know, I think when, when, when you do start chasing the dollar and, oh yeah, sure. I'll do that. And I'll do this. I think it, I, I, I yeah, I think it makes everything a lot harder and it, and you're kind of doing it for the wrong reasons. And I, I love hearing that. I think that's, I think that's so huge. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Yeah. I've, I've experienced burnout in multiple professions, you know, and people warn me <laughs> yeah. still all the time. You know, they're like, you know, don't burn out drawing, don't burn out drawing. But it's funny. I've never, ever felt like I'm getting close to a burnout. You know, it's only been a year or so, but, but that's how I feel. You you brought up the the double goalie drawing that I did of Vasilevsky and Happy Bullen. Yeah. And I remember trying to get that drawing done because they were in the Stanley cup finals at the time. I was trying to get it done in time for a game, you know, in case the NHL wanted to share it or whatnot. And I remember, you know, putting in like 19, 18, 19 hours in a day to get it done. And and even then, like, I I didn't feel like I I had to be at the tail. I didn't feel that. I just, I loved every moment of it. My hand got a little sore. Right. But even then, like I didn't, I didn't feel it. So. Yeah. No, for sure. Um, I want to geek out just a little bit and I know nothing about this, but I just want to talk a little bit about your setup. Cause if I was talking sure. to player, I, in my mind, I can see the stick he's using or the skates they're using or you yeah. know, things like that. But what, like, what would your setup be? I'm a, I, in my mind. So this is me being very, very uh, amateur artist, but, uh, or zero artist, but, um, <laughs> you kind of got like a table set up kind of like you'd see on kind of a movie type thing and yep. then your, your kind of gears there. Um, so yeah, what, what kind of a setup do you have? Well, it's actually right behind me. Let's check it out. Um, yeah. If I can kind of show it to you here, um, just rotate that. There you go. So, so this is my desk here. Yeah. It's a, it's a tilting desk. And if I tilt it now, everything's obviously yeah, okay, going to fall off you. Of it. Yeah. <laughs> um, But I got my, I got my camera here. Yeah. All right. That can kind of look down. Um, that I record all my time lapses on. Um, my pencil sitting on the side. I got all kinds of stuff down here. Like it's nothing special. Everybody asks me, they're like, well, what do you use to draw? Um, and it's just honestly just regular old graphite pencils. Okay. <laughs> you know, there's really nothing special about how I have things set up. It's it's a desk. I draw in glass. Like that's that's the coolest thing that I can tell people. <laughs> <laughs> I draw in glass. I don't know. There you go. Yeah, nice and smooth. Now, yeah. uh, I guess one of the most important questions is what's your eraser like? like you got a, you have a good eraser? I got a few different erasers. Because I would need, I'd need a box full of erasers if I was doing one of those, one of those pictures. For uh, <laughs> that's good. So I got three different types of erasers that I typically use. One's a very, very thin, it's called like a pencil eraser. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Right. So that allows me to get like really, really fine detail, um, really f- uh, fine detail highlights and in, in white areas. I got a kneadable eraser. This one's pretty standard. A lot of people that aren't sort of art people really yes. know about these. Right. But these are the erasers that are kind of like gum and you can kind of shape them and get them yeah. to go to like a really you know tight point and it lifts off little bits of, of uh, so cool. yeah. graphite. And then got this baby a little while ago it's it's a battery operated eraser electric eraser okay so, yeah so it's it's very very fine so if you do have quite a bit of buildup of pencil on the paper sometimes regular erasers won't lift that off but right. something with a little bit of mechanical force behind it you can get in there and, and okay, that, that is so. super cool man i did not know <laughs> there's actual electric or battery operated yeah. i'm pumped that is so cool yeah and uh, i'm always i'm always experimenting doing different techniques I, i'll sit at my desk 
quite often and for quite a few hours, just trying different techniques. Okay. You cool. know, like I said, I, I pick something in a drawing that I've never attempted before. So yep. before actually drawing it, you know, I'll just get out a piece of paper and just figure out, okay, what's going to be my approach for this? How am I going to do this? And I might do like four or five different sort of ideas in my head about what could work. Right. Like even when I did Joe Thornton's beard, you know, I restarted that three or four times before I finally got it the way no I wanted it to. Yeah. I was going to ask you too about um, uh, McDavid's uh, beard. Yeah. Because I mean, that, that picture's sick and it, it really like, obviously it looks identical to him, but his beard's like always kind of, when he has a beard, it's like scraggly and like uh, <laughs> yeah. the place, right? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Like how challenging is it stuff like, like uh, Thornton's beard or, or, or McDavid or, you know, adding even like, um, it might've been McDavid as well, but even like the curls coming out of the back of his helmet and stuff like I, mm-hmm. I, I don't, those might be easy. I don't know, but like, they look sick. They look, aw- they look yeah, authentic, you. you know, but um, yeah. How, how hard are some of those little details put in there? I think this is where my extensive background of drawing dogs really came in. Sure. Uh, because I drew a ton of dogs. I would say I used to tell people all the time, I, as much of uh, as much as I've drawn hockey players and you can see them all across this wall and whatnot, I've actually drawn more dogs. And at this point, it, it might be a little bit more towards the hockey players, but I've drawn so many different dogs, so many different you know styles of hair and things like not things like that. So when I've gotten to do a lot of these different beards and, and hairstyles, it hasn't been that difficult for me. Yeah. Joe Thornton's beard was a little different because he has like all these different like white patches and things <laughs> yeah, like right, that. Yeah. <laughs> that was a little different. It's called, it's um, called age. It's called age. Yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> I can't grow a beard. So I, I I, I've got the same thing, like, <laughs> what was, like salt and pepper everywhere. Yeah. Uh, but um, be, I, definitely hair. When I was first starting out, hair was one of the more challenging things to draw. Absolutely. I mean, it would draw me or it would drive me absolutely crazy. <laughs> oh, that's cool. Uh, last, last kind of nerd thing here. Uh, paper. What kind of paper would you use? Like, is it, is there a special type or is it just normal kind of paper? I've drawn on all kinds of different papers. So paper, if you're not aware, has different, um, tooth to it right so you have something that's a medium tooth that just means that there's more like grooves and texture in the paper so that the pencil lead can actually fall into and get grabbed or you can go with something that's got a little bit of tooth to it or very little tooth and it's very very smooth they call that bristol smooth and i've been using bristol smooth for most of the professional pieces that i've done Um, i just had great success using it and it's very very easy to lift off the the pencil but it's very very difficult to blend on so most people i do recommend they try something that's got a medium surface to it, more uh, more of a, a surface that's going to grab onto that pencil. And that's what most art teachers will tell them. But I've just had a lot of success with the Smooth Bristol. Cool. All right. Awesome. So anyone out yeah. there wants to try this out, there you go. You got electric uh, erasers and uh, yeah. a couple different paper types. There you go. Yeah. Regular pencils, a bunch of different erasers and smoother medium paper. That's the way to go. <laughs> Now, once you get a print done, do you like, is it obviously there's going to be the original, right? And so on your wall right now, you have a ton of pictures. Um, How many prints get made of those or how does that work as far as, you know what I mean? If you like, if like, let's say multiple people want to buy the McDavid print. Yeah. um, How does that work? So when I get them, when I finish my drawing, what I do is I bring it to Mercury Blueprinting. They've, I've been working with them since the start. They got a beautiful art scanner, one of five in Ontario, where they okay. take my piece of art. They'll just place it on the bed. And there's like all these different like cool cameras. I don't know how it works. It's super cool though. Yeah. And it'll produce a really, really high quality scan of the image. And then what we do from there is we print off 10 prints well, 15 prints. Um, and that's what I call my limited edition run. Okay. So I will inspect each one of those prints to make sure that they look good. And I'll keep 10 of those 15. And then the other five I'll rip up. And what I'll do with those 10 is I'll sign them, uh, hand sign them, and then number them out of 10. And then once I find that they look good and I get them at that point, then we'll just run off unlimited copies for people. They'll have my uh, scanned copy of my signature, but they won't be hand numbered. No way. So for every print that you do, realistically, there's 10, you know, 10 that are authentically your signature on them. That's and correct. Kind of the quality, like not the quality ones, but like those are the, that's really cool. Yeah. And so, and I, they'll, they'll attest to this. I drive them crazy over there. So they'll, they'll run off 15 and I'll look at them and I'll be like, yep, yeah, those look good. I'll bring them home and then I'll get them in a different light. And I'll be like, 
don't like it. I'll come back. I'm like, well, let's run off another 15. I'll run off another 15. I'll look at them. I'll be like, mm, no, this one's got like a little like weird mark on it. We'll run off another 15. So okay, cool. I, yeah, I, there's certain, I'm, I'm definitely a perfectionist and I've learned to kind of tone it down in certain areas and, and yeah. be more forgiving because it is a double-edged sword, but I definitely let the perfectionism run free when I'm making these limited edition prints. I love it, man. Okay. I, I got two quick stories on that for you. So yeah. I don't know if you know this or not, you may know this and players out there and parents may, may know this as well, but Hockey players will get like dozens of hockey sticks, right? So you'll, you know, they'll, Joe Thornton, for instance, will have, you know, a couple dozen hockey sticks. Well, when they get a batch, usually they'll grab them in fours or sixes and they'll pull the sticks out and they'll line them up. So they're looking down the shaft and they'll, they'll kind of look at each stick. And these are brand new, you know, let's be honest, retail $300, $400 hockey yeah. stick, right? They're looking down them and no, no, yeah. Yeah. And they'll pick, like, not every player does this, but a lot, like the players that are really picky about their gear, they will literally, not not throw because those will go to resale and stuff like that but yeah, out of a dozen sticks they may only keep six because they didn't like the way the other three or four or six look i had so, no idea yeah it's kind of cool man like it's not well parents are probably cringing right now are you kidding me <laughs> um but yeah it's, it's really it's yeah I, I i didn't know that either until obviously i, I started playing pro and i know and i got had a chance to kind of be uh, behind the scenes with uh with with nhl teams but yeah it's really really it's it's interesting the other thing too is uh, Don Cherry, who's obviously a polarizing figure, but Don Cherry would sign autographs. And if he didn't like how he, how his signature looked on something, he would, he wouldn't put it out. He'd throw it away. And he, and he like, he was very, very particular about how he signed. Uh, and to your point, he just, that was his mark. That was his, yeah. you know, that, that represents him. So if it didn't look good or he didn't like how he signed it, he wouldn't, he'd throw it out and he'd sign another one. He'd sign another one. So, yeah. um, I love that. I lo- that's, you know, that's going back probably to a bit of your like, you know, mastering or perfection, you know, being a bit of a perfectionist potentially, but uh, yeah, it's cool. But I mean, that's good to know because people know that they're getting something that you actually looked at and you okayed and you, you know, because I think a lot of times when I see prints or you see pictures, you're like, how many of these are there, number one? And, yeah. you know, was it even looked at? Like, you know what I mean? Uh, you know, I know there's an original usually and then how many, you know, how many prints are made and yeah. Uh, Oh, yeah, cool. that's that's such an interesting story about John Don Cherry. I didn't know that about him, but I but I relate to it because there have been some instances where you know I'll be signing, I'll be signing, I'll be signing, and then I screw up a signature, I try again, screw up the signature, get mad, try another one, and all of a sudden I don't have another one. Then I'm then I gotta call up Mercury and be like, I need another fifty. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. So that's so interesting. I didn't know that. That's so yeah. cool. <laughs> um, now are those ten that you keep? Um, what happens to those? Like, are those kind of, uh, like you can, I'm, I'm going to assume those will be more like a premium print, right? That would be more of a, a pre yeah. Okay. Yeah. They're more of a premium print. And what I'll do is I'll set aside five for pre-order. So as I'm completing a drawing, I'll post pro- uh, progress pics across my Instagram and my Facebook. Okay. And I'll just say, if anyone's interested in, in having one of these, because they are difficult to get their hands on sometimes, um, just send me a message and I'll set one aside for you. And then the other five are available upon release. Awesome. That's really yeah. cool. And, and how, 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 and uh, you don't want to tell me numbers or like that, but how sure. has sales been overall, like on some of your bigger prints or some of your more, you know, kind of profiled players and stuff like that, has it been pretty good as far as, you know, getting sales and, and, and moving prints on? I would say so. Um, the, like the big names have done really, really well, you know, Marner and Matthews, those guys are always favorites. Um, I say the most successful one I've ever done though, is my Steve Eiserman. <laughs> that one okay, cool, really, yeah. like I, I've learned so much about the different fan bases based on the players that I draw. And when I drew Steve Eiserman, like I learned that wings fans are huge fans. Like they, they absolutely, especially there's huge Steve Eiserman fans. Like yeah. I think I released Steve Eiserman. I didn't have any available for pre-order, but I released Steve Eiserman and they sold out in like 31 minutes or something. Way, like that. That's like awesome, it, man. It, just, it just, yeah, just went crazy. And then obviously, you know, Christmas really, really picked up. Um, things went crazy at that point in time and things have definitely died down. I would say yeah. since, uh, you know, after Christmas and, and the whole lockdown, not lockdown thing that's going on and we're trying to be in the market, we're trying to sell prints and all of a sudden we're locked down, you know, yeah. so that certainly has, um, brought things down a bit, but yeah. no, it's, it's been overall been pretty good. good for you. That's great. You know, what's weird though, is I think this whole hockey season and you're in that hockey market. So yeah. I'm in the hockey market and it's really, really weird this year because a lot of the minor hockey kids didn't really have a season. They kind of had no, yeah. popped up. And then the NHL season is weird because it kind of stopped and went and stopped and went. So you had these different off seasons where there was no hockey and then it came back. And so there was no like, there's no like kind of good ebb and flow to it. You know what I mean? Where normally you yeah. have like the playoffs and then you've got a little bit of break and then you start the regular season, get people get amped up for that. And then you got, so there, it's been a weird year that way to kind of keep, you know, keep 
if you're in the business to kind of keep things moving the way the season's moving because it's so chopped yeah. up. And it's so tough to make business decisions too, right? It, sure. It's, it, you know, you base them on year to years and yeah. and months to months, and it's like you don't know what's coming next. You really don't because everything's behaving so so strangely. Yeah. Right? Absolutely. Oh, oh, for sure. Well, buddy, man, this has been awesome. I don't want to take up too much of your time, but I really, uh, yeah, I really appreciate you coming on and, and having this conversation. And uh, it's, it's been, it's great. I'm going to, I'm going to, I always ask players this. So I'm going to ask you this. Sure. Um, if you were talking to yourself at like 13, 14 and kind of that grade, let's say seven, eight, nine, 10, and that kind of those, those years where you were locked into being a physio and stuff, but what, what kind of advice would you give to those young, kind of those young people kind of coming through and that maybe they have a bit of a skill for maybe it's art, maybe it's painting, maybe it's sculpting, whatever that is, but what, you know, what kind of advice would you give them? Two things. Definitely. I would say to myself and others is try to learn more about yourself first, <laughs> right? Yeah. High school is such a tough time because you're trying to be somebody or not, you know? Yeah. And and I get it. It's easy for me to say, oh, be yourself. And it's easy for parents to say that. But it's, you know what, like do what you need to do, but also learn more about yourself in the process. You know, I would definitely, uh, you know, when I was going through um, cognitive behavioral therapy, which I still practice to this day, um, you do all kinds of different exercises that just kind of asks questions in a different way and gets you to approach things in a different way. And, and answering those questions really help learn more about yourself. So 100%, you know, don't be afraid to explore new things and learn more about yourself and be honest with yourself. Um, but then also don't be afraid to follow your passion. You know, it doesn't have to be something that you pursue as a career. It doesn't have to be something that, you know, you're doing eight hours a day. But if there's something that you do, even if it's for an instant, you're like, wow, that was really fun. You know, don't be afraid to try it again and explore more of it. Love it. Yeah, I know. I think that's, I think that's huge, man. Uh, you said something about high school that, man, that rings such a bell with me. And I, I was fortunate. I played sports and stuff and I fit in well with groups in high school. It was all good, but I look back on high school socks. Yeah. Like really like this clicky it's, it's, you know, you got the, you got the smart people, the nerds, you got the jocks, you got whatever, you know, it's just, it's, and yeah, you're trying to like fit in. You're trying to, you're not really being your authentic self all the time. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I think it's, you're right. I think that is a, uh, I think that's, yeah, that's great advice, man. I love it. I'm, I may go back to high school next year and and, and practice that. <laughs> it it's so crazy. You know, now you look back and you're like, wow, I wish I was there now so I could do things differently. Right. I'm like, yeah. I remember when I got out of, when I got my kinesiology degree um, and then got my master's in physio and I look back, I was like, I kind of want to do it again, yeah. you know, and, but really approach it differently with a different attitude instead of just getting a piece of paper, sit down and actually learn something. <laughs> it's, it's funny though, right? Cause when, like when you look back on all those experiences as, as an older gentleman now or an older female, you look back like, Oh man, I would have done it so much differently. And then I always think it was like, yeah, but would you have, because now we would have, cause we know what we know. But even now, like I try to, you know, you try to tell young kids, man, you got to appreciate this. You got to like, and it's so hard. No, I know you can't. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, you, right? you got to almost live it. You got to just live it and you yeah. can give the advice you want to give. And hopefully they get a little bit of that advice and they, it, it sinks in, but it's so hard because I'm sure. And I know I can remember conversations I've had with my parents or aunts, uncles, whoever, just saying, you know, telling you these things that we're telling ourselves or telling kids now. And, you know, did I listen that well? Probably not. not to <laughs> yeah. advice. Nah, maybe a little bit, but not, you know, maybe not to the extent I should have. Right. Yeah. What, but, what I'll say is, um, I, I did listen to an audiobook called Quiet by Susan Cain. Okay. And it's it's looking at the power of an introvert in an extrovert world, you know, because I am an introvert. Sure. And it, it absolutely changed my life. So, you know, if, if yeah. So if you're somebody who's an introvert cool. or, or shy or, or feels like you need to be an extrovert, or even if, you know, you're an extrovert trying to understand introverts a little bit more. Um, it's an amazing book and it, and it sheds a lot of light on so many things. And, and I really try to advocate people, you know, if, if you're not a reader, do the audio book. I'm not a reader myself, yeah, yeah. Right? but, but uh, it's, it's a really, really good read. Absolutely. Oh, that's great, man. I'm, I'm a hundred percent on the same page as you. I do not read anymore. Everything's an audio book for yeah. me. Yeah. Uh, just cause I can listen to it in the car or working out or doing whatever. And I don't have to, cause I'm, I'm a slow reader. It would take me months to get through some books that are totally. big and, yeah. So that's huge. Can I, I want to ask you one question though, about the introvert sure. um, being an introvert for you. It, like, do you, do you kind of recharge just kind of being on your own? Meaning, you know, if you like, for instance, for me, I think I'm more of an extrovert. I get more charged up by being around people or having yeah. a barbecue or doing things like that. Right. My wife yeah. is very different than I am. She'd rather just read a book and chill out. And that's what she loves to do where I'm like, come on, man, can we have people over? Like, can we do yeah. something, you know? So um, is that, is that kind of defined kind of where kind of, 
what you are as far as, as, as an introvert, you'd rather just kind of chill, do your own thing. hundred percent. I mean, yeah. if th- things like this, I love this, this yeah. is amazing. Right. Um, because we're talking about stuff that I'm super passionate about, you know, but it's, this is something where I was like, I'm going to have to recharge my batteries after this. Right. It's sure. just, it just takes a lot out of me. Yeah. I remember when I was doing uh, physiotherapy, you know, our sessions with my clients would be 20 minutes, half hour. And then after each appointment, I would have to close my door for like five, 10 minutes just to kind of try to refocus and, and recharge just because like each one of those things just took so much out of me. So yeah, definitely. You know, like I love parties and I love hanging out with friends and I love doing all that stuff, but it, it, it does, you know, drain the batteries a little bit in a different way. And sort of these things that Susan Cain would call a restorative niche um, allows me to go out and do those things more and more regularly. And that's what drawing is for me too. You know, it's a restorative yeah. niche. Whereas I used to have to pursue restorative niches to do my job. Now my job is my restorative yeah. niche. So it, it's a great fit for me. And, and yeah. No, it's cool. And the reason I want to bring that up is because I think a lot of, you know, there's obviously we're, we're, we're uh, categorizing it as two things, introvert, yes. expert. There's a lot of things around there, but I think for me, I know when I'm around and my wife, I wouldn't call my wife a super like very introverted, but she loves just her own time and stuff like that. And I didn't get mm-hmm. it. I, I didn't get it at first. You know, I would just go, 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 go. Especially when we were younger and didn't have kids. It was like, let's go, let's go, let's go. And I didn't understand or appreciate it. And well, over conversation with her and kind of figuring each other out, I was like, and I really appreciate it now. I really like, I love her having her own time. I like her, you know, be able to re- recharge the way she wants to recharge, but it took me a while to understand it. And I think this is a really important thing for a lot of young people, especially parents and, and people going through, let's say high school or whatever it is, but people are different and, you know, learning how to, un- or figuring out how to understand what they are and how they, how they work, I think is huge, you know, because, um, Man, if, if you're pushed all the time to be outside your comfort zone, you're not going to be a very happy person, right? So no, you're going to burn out quick. <laughs> totally, yeah. So you know, understand yeah. that and like appreciate it, and and I think is is massive. So, um, no, oh, it's yeah, that's I yeah, I appreciate you sharing that. That's that's really no, cool. no, likewise, and and I and I hope more people can can talk about this kind of thing, right? Because I think a lot of people who might be introverts, they see people that are very outgoing, and they're on you know national stages, and and they see that person, they say, I need to be that way to be successful because we do live in a world where, um, you know, people I think that are viewed as successful are, are sort of in the spotlight, right? Because they are extroverts and they are comfortable with that. So I think it's easy for introverts to kind of say, Oh, you know, maybe I'm not as important or I won't be as successful because I'm, I'm shy or whatever it is, but there, everybody, um, you know, has a role and can be successful in different ways. And that's what I try to advocate as well. So I appreciate you sharing that story. Oh, that's awesome, man. It's, it's so good. And I, I think you're right. I think communicating and talking about it because a lot of times, especially over this last year, there's a lot of people dealing with a lot of different things and, yeah. um, and you're not alone. And I know it sounds super cheesy to say that, but there's so many people that are dealing with things too. And I'm not trying to compare stories or saying, Oh, I've, I've done this, you've done that. It's just, you know, you're not alone. And the more we can communicate and talk about it, it's, it's, I, I think that helps so much, you know, it just, it, it, it kind of, okay. I now I have something to relate to now. I can actually, you know, kind of talk about this and not feel like I'm so alone with it, you know? Yeah. And I was, I was talking to Tom powers on, on CBCQ. And as soon as that was done, I had such an influx of messages from people that are like, Oh my goodness, like I'm an introvert. And I just thought I was alone in this. I literally thought I'm the only person that thought this way. And I was exactly that way too. And you know, if you are an introvert, you're not going to be the kind of person that just walks up to somebody and be like, Hey, you know what? Do you ever feel like being quiet's okay or not okay? <laughs> yeah, <right. Yeah. laughs> you oh. know? So yeah, yeah I, I'm gonna continue to to try to be vocal about that. Yeah. But I mean, even this, like, you know, you and I have just met, we kind of met through mutual friends and stuff, but you know, we had a, you know, let's call it a 40 minute hour conversation. And, you know, that's what it takes though, is having these conversations and then it comes out kind of at the end, you know, which is fine, matter, but it's just, it's not, like you said, you're not going to meet somebody like, Hey, how you doing? I'm an extrovert. Hey, what's going on? Like exactly happen. But by having conversations, Hey, how's your day going? Whatever you can potentially get to know somebody well, or even if it's a buddy, you know, like how often you talk to buddies and then get into a good conversation with them. Like, Hey, how's everything going? How are the wife and kids? Like how bad, like how shitty is it right now with your job? And kind of asking kind of tougher questions rather than just sometimes always a superficial stuff you know i think is huge yeah that's true definitely and that's a good point you know we we had a conversation for 40 minutes and now we're talking about the end because he asked an amazing question um but you know even if people have sort of a little bit more of an understanding too are around the different types of personalities and how people might act i think there's there could be an awareness there that helps with sort of interactions and doesn't allow or, or doesn't i guess have somebody jump to a conclusion 
about totally. somebody, you know, right off the bat. So yeah, yeah definitely key. Love it, man. Well, I, I, I could chat with you now for another hour on, on all this kind of stuff. Oh, yeah. Easily. Like, yeah. Easily. Totally. Really. Listen, buddy, I, I really appreciate you coming on. This is uh this is awesome. And uh, I was, I, I wanted to tell you this and I'll put it on the air. So now, now I'm keep myself accountable on this, but I'm going to, I want to buy a couple of prints off you for sure. So oh, awesome. On that. Oh, thank you so uh, much. Yeah, if you can see my, my setup is very, very, <laughs> I got a light and a, cheesy poster so we gotta, we gotta get some more stuff in this it's clean man it's yeah, minimalistic yeah, yeah that's right, that's right. <laughs> i got a bunch of funko pops on this wall you know what i mean like everybody's got their own style i guess <laughs> uh where can people find you though people are looking for prints or, or like to d or you know dm you or message you to to maybe you know get get you to to, to, to do a, a print for them or, or sure. purchase stuff but yeah where uh where can people find you so first of all, if you go to my website, petensart.ca, P-I-E-T-E-N-S art.ca, um, that's where you can see all of my portfolio. You can buy all my different stuff. Um, you can also follow me on Instagram and Facebook and reach out to me on any of those uh, channels. Awesome. Awesome. Well, buddy, thank you very much, man. This is great. And uh, best of luck with everything. And yeah, keep uh, keep the pencil and the paper. Awesome. It's <laughs> been a great discussion. Thanks so much for having me, Dwayne. All right, buddy. Extra gear, that first three steps, huge strides in the performance that I might not be the player I am today.